please, if you've brought a Bible with you, or a device, doesn't matter, turn in that to the book of 1 Timothy chapter 3. And uh, as you see on the, the board, I'm bringing a message this morning entitled Shepherd Elders. And um, it, it's time for the church to talk openly about an elder ministry and what it is, uh, who qualifies, uh, what, what elders do. And I understand, I haven't heard any, but I understand there's lots of rumors floating around the body, uh, such as the elders have already been handpicked and they're just waiting for this to be done. And, and folks, don't pay any attention to anybody that tells you something like that. That is absolutely false. No elder, no proposal will ever be entertained that isn't brought through this body of believers and this body authorizes and this body votes to do. Uh, and, and, you know, if you'll bear with me this week and next week, I will share about shepherd elders. And I, I use that term shepherd elders on purpose. The shepherd sheep image is the image that is most associated with what the work of an elder is. And you know from reading the Psalms, you know from reading about Jesus as the good shepherd, that that sheep-shepherd relationship is a very unique relationship. It is one where the shepherd is self-giving. He's sacrificial. He's, he's 24-7 on the job. He leads the sheep to where they can get into water that's safe for them to walk into and drink. He leads them to pasture where they can be well fed without danger. He protects the sheep from predators. When a man was a shepherd in Bible times, he was totally committed to the sheep that he was tending. And he would literally, according to the Lord Jesus, lay his life down for the sheep. And that doesn't always mean dying for the sheep. That could mean that, that he's willing to sacrificially live his life in a way that proves to the sheep that they are a priority in his life. And when we talk about elders, I want you to keep that picture in your mind of a shepherd elder, of a man who is willing to place his entire heart and his entire life in the ministry of serving God's people through the local church. So with that in mind, I want to invite you to stand and read our text in the book of 1 Timothy chapter 3. And I'm going to begin reading in verse 13. When you find that, would you give me a big fat amen? amen. It's pretty chubby. I thank you for that. Here, Paul says, is a trustworthy saying. Whoever aspires to be an overseer desires a noble task. Now, the overseer is to be above reproach, faithful to his wife, temperate, Self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him, and he must do so in a manner worthy of full respect. If anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. 
He must also have a good reputation with outsiders so that he will not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. In the same way, deacons are to be worthy of respect, sincere, not indulging in much wine and not pursuing dishonest gain. They must keep hold of the deep truths of the faith with a clear conscience. They must first be tested, and then if there is nothing against them, let them serve as deacons. In the same way, the women are to be worthy of respect, not malicious talkers, but temperate and trustworthy in everything. A deacon must be faithful to his wife, manage his children, and his household well. Those who have served well gain an excellent standing and a great and great assurance in their faith in Christ Jesus. Father, please be with us. And I pray that you'll anoint the preaching of your word in a way that is easily understandable, in a way that is clear and concise, and in a way that gives an understanding of what elder ministry is all about. And Father, this is as much a, a teaching lesson as it is a preaching lesson and I pray you deliver me from being boring and that you allow me to preach in a way this morning that captures everyone's attention and everyone's heart and I pray and ask this in the name of the Lord Jesus amen this is going to be a two-part sermon uh I, I'm going to preach three things this morning. Uh, I'm going to preach from this text two biblical offices. I am going to preach three terms to remember. And I'm going to preach 14 qualifiers for a man to serve as an elder in a local New Testament church. Next week, I will take you through both the pastoral epistles and into the book of Acts and describe in detail the work that an elder does in a local New Testament church. And I want you to stay with me. I want you to be prayerful this week. I, I, I want you to, to really be open to the teaching and the instruction of God's Word. So we'll begin this morning with two biblical offices in the New Testament church. And here in 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 13, those two officers are described by the Apostle Paul. Now, the first are deacons. And we come to know about deacons in Acts chapter 6 when the first century church in Jerusalem was, was expanding and, and really blowing up numerically. They, they were growing exponentially. And there were a number of different kinds of people, but basically there were two groups of people. There were Hellenists, which simply means they were Roman. They were Gentiles. And they were coming to know the Lord. And there were Jews who had grown up in Judaism, but they had come to know the Lord too. And the, those coming out of Judaism became the pillars of the church. They became the leaders of the church. And the Hellenists began to complain. The Romans began to complain. We have widows of, of our group of people, and when they are giving the distribution of food and help daily for those widows, as the church should and as the church should be doing today as well, the Romans were being ignored. And so the apostles got together and said, listen, our role here is to study the Word of God. It is to pray over the Word of God. It is to pray over the people. And it wouldn't be right for us to take the time that God has given us for the study of the Word and for prayer and to work this situation out. And so they came up with a solution. And they said, choose from yourselves seven men, full of the Spirit, godly men, and we will appoint them to this task. Now, the word that they used for this was the word diakonoi. Greek word diakonos was the root, but this was the tense that meant 
these men are to continually be serving the needs of the people in the church. That, that word diakonoi literally means to serve tables through the dust. And it gave the picture of someone who, who was a, a household servant who would be serving the meal as they walked through the dust on the floor and, and they would come and lay it out for the people that they served. A deacon, then, is a servant of the people of God. In fact, I believe that the greatest way to describe what the deacon ministry is is that a deacon serves God by serving the people of a local church. Now, being a deacon does not convey any kind of sense of authority or power in the local church. Being a a deacon, it's not a great leadership position as many churches have made it to be. A deacon serves the physical, the emotional, the spiritual needs of the people under his care. And the only authority that a deacon ever gains through his ministry is that, that respect and that authority that comes through a servant's heart, and people get to know their deacon, they get to know his heart, and as they do, they respect him, and there is this authority given because of who the person is. Not a power position, not authority of power, but an influence that comes from the sacrificial work that a deacon does to the family that he serves. Now, the second New Testament office, and we see it in this text, the second New Testament office is that of shepherd elders. Now, in in this text, he's called an overseer. And I'll, I'll get back to that word in a minute when we talk about the three terms to remember. But guys, for a local church to be as effective as God wants local churches to be, it must have thriving ministries in both of these offices. There, the deacon ministry of an local New Testament church must be a thriving, growing ministry where deacons are really serving the people of the church. Now, I will tell you something that I hear from our deacons. I I hear often that our deacons say that they call and request to come and visit, and many of you tell the deacons, no, you don't need to come to my house. I also hear that they call and leave messages, and those messages are never returned. They send texts, and those texts are never answered. And guys, please listen. Your deacon minister cannot minister to you if you will not allow him to minister. Now, not only is he willing to be sacrificially involved in your life, you must be willing to allow him to serve you. Now, just saying. Um, that, 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 That old saying, you can lead a horse to water, you can't make them drink. And we can lead you to water all we want. But if you don't drink, we can't minister to you. You have to be willing. So do that. But listen, listen. Listen very carefully to this. I served Hopedale Baptist Church for 35 years. We did not have an elder ministry those 35 years. And, and as I've researched the past couple of months, I need to apologize to them, by the way. I, I didn't take the time to research what elders were. Most Southern Baptist churches do not have elders. Some are beginning to now. And I didn't take the time to educate myself on it. Last night, I guess it's this morning, it's about 1 o'clock this morning, I'm sitting at the kitchen table mulling all of this over. And I started going through 
problems and difficulties that we had at Hopedale. And almost every divisive issue, almost every problem that came up in the life of Hopedale, the 35 years that I served them, would have been mediated and it would have gone away with a properly formed shepherd elder ministry. Bad doctrine people's lives that didn't match up with what it should be. And guys, the role of an elder in a local New Testament church is a robust work. Um, Now, I want you to remember, there are two. Now, are you listening? There are two and only two two offices in the New Testament church. And those two offices are deacons and elders. Deacons and shepherd elders. Now all of our committees, all of our boards are created out of necessity. All of our directors of ministry, we we have those because they're necessary. But none of those can be allowed in a New Testament church to supersede the influence of shepherd, elders, and deacons in the church because they are not prescribed in Scripture. The leadership of a New Testament church, and I will go into this in great detail next Sunday morning, The leadership of a New Testament church, a local body of believers, has been given by God to a plurality of men chosen by the church, examined by the church to make sure that they meet the requirements, and then set apart by the church to do the work of that ministry. Two, and only two offices. Now, the next thing that I want you to see is that there are three terms to remember. This is critical that there is an understanding of these. The first is the word overseer. In the Greek, it's episkopeo. And let me give you a list of what I, I learned when I did the word studies on this word. Episcopal. We get our word episcopal from it. And what does that word mean? I'm trying to go slow. It's not in my nature to go slow, but I'm going to try to go slow so if you're taking notes, you can write these down. First, it means to give attention to something. A shepherd elder gives attention to the flock that God has called him to be the overseer of. It means to watch after. It means to take care of. It it means to see to it. That was a general term, and 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 it in this case would see would be the oversight of the church. It it means to accept the responsibility to care for someone else. A shepherd elder is not a director or a board member. Please keep that in your mind. Take the idea of an elder board out of your vocabulary and replace that with shepherd elders. Shepherd elders are willing to accept the responsibility to care for the body of the New Testament church. It it means giving oversight to. It is often translated in literature, superintendent or guardian. The biblical record is clear. It is crystal clear that in the first century church, In the Pauline epistles, in Peter's epistle, crystal clear 
that there were a group of men appointed to oversee the ministry of local churches. Paul, Peter, very clearly teach this in their epistles. Now listen very carefully. The Bible is also equally plain that the point of this office of shepherd elder is service and oversight and service and oversight alone. We talk about elder boards. I myself have used that term over and over again. But as I research what a shepherd elder really is, that term skews the meaning of the work of a shepherd elder. And I believe this is the picture that many of you have of what an elder ministry would look like. Uh, a board gives the picture of a, of a group of people in a boardroom somewhere who are absolutely in control of everything. Kind of that ivory tower mentality where they're sitting in their ivory tower and they're pointing fingers and they're saying, you do this and you do that. And that has no place. Nothing could be further from the truth. Now, the second term is elder. The Greek word is presbyteros. In this point, the ending is presbyteroi, and, and it, it denotes in the tension, the tense that it's in, that it is continuous action. The shepherd elder never stops. It denotes one who is older in age in regards to another person. In other words, if I'm sitting with Janice, I'm older than Janice. Well, that's not true. I'm, that's a bad illustration. And how does one say in front of like 300 people that my wife is older than me? Throw you under the bus again. So it would come as no surprise to you that she's also wiser and all of those things. Elder of two in age, not necessarily an older person, though that is part of the meaning. Presbyter, presbyteroi is a term of rank. It is, it is a term of, of position or office. It came to mean in the first century church a mature man having seasoned judgment in his heart and life. Presbyter Roy is someone who presides over an assembly. And the third term is bishop. And again, it, it is that Greek word episkopeo. It is that same word that is most often translated overseer. Now, folks, listen very carefully to me. And, and, and when you get into these word studies and things, I know that I know that this can be boring. And I'm sorry, but you have to understand these terms. These three terms, overseer, elder, bishop, are used interchangeably in the New Testament. It is one office, and I believe for the New Testament church, for a local assembly such as ours, it is best referred to as the shepherd elder. Now let's move forward. There are 14 qualifiers for a man to become an elder in a local New Testament church. Don't, don't let the, the word 14 scare you that we're going to be here for a long, long time. Time will not allow me to do a deep treatment of every one of these, but I do want you to have a basic understanding of what God says an elder in a local New Testament church must be like. So let's walk through them. Number one, the elder must be above reproach. Now be careful there because that does not mean sinless. If it meant sinless, there could only be one elder, and he died for us, and he's ascended into heaven. What this word above reproach means, or this term above reproach is, that no one can bring a valid charge against your character. Now, people are going to complain about elders. People complain about deacons. 
I, I might say something about my friend Jim, but I doubt that I could give a valid claim against Brother Jim's character. Doesn't mean that someone's not going to complain. It doesn't mean that someone might come and tell the local church, this man is of poor character. What it means is that no one could do it with a valid claim. No one could come in and say, I saw Brother Jones out the other night and he did X, Y, and Z, and I believe those are ungodly. The man who desires to be an elder must be a man whose life is lived both inside the church and outside the church in a way that people look at him and know that they know that this man is of noble character, that he is a man who who is distinctly Christ-like in his walk with God. Number two, faithful to his wife. In the Greek, mias. Gynoike, Andre, literally, a one-woman man. It speaks of faithfulness in the marriage relationship. It speaks of goodness and kindness in the marriage relationship. It doesn't just speak of a man who stays with his wife or, or a man who, who is, is such a person that he's got his wife under his thumb and under his foot. Back home in, in, in the Ozark Mountains, we call it, he, he's not a guy that keeps his wife barefoot and pregnant and under his control. Now listen to me very carefully. This speaks of sexual purity in a man's life. No man that looks at pornography, no man that lusts after other women, no man who has on his mind sexual sinfulness ever, ever, ever should be selected by a church. And guys, if I am allowed to be part of examining Matt's coming. Thank you very much. So just kind of pay attention right here, and and we have people that will help take care here. Uh, No man who has these kinds of notions in his mind should ever, ever be considered to be an elder. Now, why? Uh, Are you aware, down through the centuries, centuries, both in the life of Israel and in the life of the New Testament church, Satan's greatest point of attack has been with the leadership of the New Testament church. If Satan can get a pastor, and and don't make any mistake about this, elders are pastors in a local church. They may not be the preaching pastor. They may not be called full-time to serve in a salary or under a salary, but they are pastors. And guys, if Satan can get to the pastor, to the shepherd elders, it is not long before the church begins to fail. Are you listening? When a church leader allows the sanctity of the marriage to be compromised, when he allows sexual impurity in his life. Hey, Miss Kendrick, grab that microphone. And would you, please, would you please lead us in prayer for this sweet lady? you get her mic? Heavenly Father, we just come to you right now, and we just pray that you be with Janet, uh, be with her sweet husband, Don. And Father, I just pray, Lord, that you would take control of the issues that are going on right now, that you would uh, strengthen her, and that you would lead her to a place of safety where she can get the treatment that she needs. 
uh, just speak peace into them and just let them feel your presence as they, as they leave this service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Magoo. So can I get you all to refocus? Let me take an aside here. And guys, this also speaks to the gender issue. There are two offices in the New Testament church that are gender specific. Deacon, elder. It, it isn't about culture. If it were cultural, Paul had, had plenty of vocabulary to address it. And, and if, if you need me to go into that, I, I would be glad with anyone to have that conversation as, as to why it's gender specific. Husband of one wife is fairly specific. Every noun in both the text about elders are masculine nouns. And I know that in the 21st century, people want to call that misogynist. People want to say that you, 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 you just don't want women in power, that you're trying to hold women down. Uh, I, I believe in, in my 40 plus years, 45 years as a pastor, that I have done as much to elevate women in the service of the local New Testament church as any pastor could. And in this church right now, there are ladies who serve in incredible ways. Nobody wants to limit that. But the truth of Scripture is there are two offices in the New Testament church deacon and elder, and they are, by the word of God, gender specific. And I, I read probably all the same blogs that you read. I, 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 I go through them. But to make this thing say anything other than, than these offices are gender specific, you have to wrestle the text. I'm a biblical literalist. The Bible tells us when there is an allegory. The Bible tells us when we're to take something uh, as symbolic. The Bible tells us in the context if this is to be culturally understood. And it ain't here, folks. Now, I'm just a bow-legged old preacher from Mount State, Missouri. But I know the Word of God. And I know biblical hermeneutics. I know how to study the Word of God. I know how to exegete a text. And you can't make this say what it doesn't say. Now, third, temperate. This means sober-minded. Uh, the greatest thing that this means is that the shepherd elder must be serious about the work of the church. He's not playing with this. He's not uh, taking on the position of being a shepherd elder in order to have a position of power or, or to be able to lord that over other people. In fact, the scriptures are quite specific that the elder doesn't do that. It means he's alert and level-headed. Number four, and I've got to move, guys, self-controlled. And this self-controlled is part of the fruit of the Spirit that Paul describes in Galatians 5. Hey, Janice, throw me a pen. That one right there will do. Whoops, that was on me. E6, guys, right there. Here's what I'm going to do, because I, I need to change directions here for a second. I'm going to stop right here. Maybe we won't have as many announcements next week. 
But, but here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to stop right here, and I will pick these 14 qualifiers up, and, I, and I'll start with number four. And then when I close that out, um, I'll, I'll, I'll go to the book of Acts and the epistles, the, the pastoral epistles, epistles on, on what an elder does, the service that he does. But I want to ask a question right now. Why? Why did God set up the, the governance of the New Testament church to be elders and deacons? And why did he give to shepherd elders the task of overseeing the church? Well, because, and, and we'll get to this in the Peter passage, but he did that because the Bible has taught us, and Paul knew, that there were wolves both inside the church and outside the church that were teaching false doctrine. They were teaching things diametrically opposed to the teaching of God. And God created these two offices for the protection of the body of Christ, to protect the doctrine, to protect one of the sheep from being led astray. The shepherd's sheep picture is such a great picture because if, if a shepherd had a hundred sheep, and Jesus used this as an example one time himself. He had a hundred sheep. And, and he's got those hundred sheep in the fold and safe. And one has wandered off. He's counting. And guys, understand, in Bible days, the sheep not only, or the shepherd not only counted the sheep, he knew the sheep. He knew them by name. And so he's going through, and he's in Elijah and Isaiah, and he comes around and he says... Where's Jeremiah? He's not here. He would block the door to the sheepfold. Whether it's midnight, whether it's morning, he would leave those 90 and 9, and he would go make sure that lost sheep was safe. If the sheep needed discipline, the shepherd would discipline it. If the lamb needed loving and caring attention, that's what he gave. That's part of the office of the shepherd elder. Keep an eye on the sheep. Keep the sheep safe. Love the sheep. To be willing to die for the sheep if that's necessary. You remember David when, when the... Philistine giant was mocking the people of God. <laughs> and David, this little shepherd boy, comes in and says to them, what, what in the world is going on here? Why is this uncircumcised Philistine, what that means, why is this unbeliever mocking the army of God, the God of Israel? Get out, you're just a kid. What do you say? While I was tending my father's sheep, a lion came. And I took the lamb out of the mouth of the lion and I grabbed it by the beard and I slayed it. What did this little boy do? He laid his life on the line for the sheep. And listen to me. The position of an elder in a local New Testament church is a 24-7 position, just like mine. They are men that if I get that midnight call and there is trouble, I call one and we go together to solve the problem. There's another reason. Another reason why God created this position and gave it to the New Testament church 
is because God has a specific mission for the New Testament church. And you all know what that mission is. It is the salvation of lost souls. Guys, we live in a world of hurting, desperate people. And without Jesus Christ, there is no hope. Are you listening? Without a personal relationship with Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, there is no hope in this life. There certainly is no hope in the afterlife. And elders are set in place by God to make sure that that main thing of reaching people for Jesus remains the main thing for the church. Can I ask you a question? You know I'm going to ask you anyway. You might as well say yes. <laughs> Have you had that experience? That once in a lifetime, definitive experience where you turn from your sin and you turn to Jesus Christ as your Savior. You all know, I, I think this was in my resume and things, but you all know that I'm a licensed uh, mental health therapist in Missouri. I'm not here in Pennsylvania, but I am in Missouri. And uh, three weeks after we retired from the pastorate, I opened a private practice. And I opened it inside the office of the Tri-County Southern Baptist Association. It was an association of 56 churches. And there wasn't a week that went by that I didn't get a call from a pastor who would tell me, I, I have a couple th that can't get it together and I don't know how to help them. I have a, I have a teenager who has threatened to kill himself, herself. What do I do, Terry? We all know. I've heard that I'm a good therapist. I don't really know, but I've heard I am. But it, it is not the power of a therapist that makes a difference. It is Jesus Christ in you, the hope of glory. Where are you at right now? Deep hurt, deep pain. The sense that life is caving in all around you, you gotta turn to Jesus. He's a great physician. He's the only hope. Right now, right now where you're sitting, if you would be willing to turn from your sin, trust Jesus Christ as the crucified, and risen Savior and invite him to be your Savior and Lord. Right now, in the twinkling of an eye, at the snap of a finger, you will be transformed from darkness to light. You will be transformed from the death of sin to the life in the Spirit of God. Can you tell me why you wouldn't do that? Can, can you honestly say there's a good reason why I don't trust Jesus today. See, he's waiting on you right now. And he's not waiting for you to clean up your act. He's not waiting for you to get it together. He's not waiting for you to become something. He's simply waiting on you to surrender your life to him. He cleans you up. He makes something out of you. Would you bow your head and close your eyes? 
would you say to me this morning, Pastor Terry, I am receiving Jesus right now, right now. And if you would say that to me, would you just lift your hand up and keep it up till I acknowledge it? Right now, I'm taking Jesus. I'm surrendering my life to him. Lift that hand up in the air so I can see it. Okay? Lift her right up there high. Thank you. Father, we love you. There are folks here right now that have said by their testimony, I am taking Jesus right now. Would you call them out of their seats and have them come? Would you have them come make that concrete in front of people who love them? There are others that have been on the verge of making this eternity-changing decision but haven't quite done it. Would you lead them today? May we fill this altar up today with folks praying about your will, folks praying about the will of this church, but mainly folks praying for people to be saved right now, praying for Satan to be bound and, and, and bound from affecting people's decision. And Father, would you bring people to yourself today? We pray and ask in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen.